Right, I'm thrilled to be back here with my good friend, Sir John Hamilton. Sir. We should be Sir. Thank you very much. I believe. believe you've got me in one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Of EQ Studios. <laughs> and um, we've been working together on tracks for how long now? Since I was a five, teenager. Four, four or five years. Four or five years. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing all sorts of stuff. And you, songwriter, musician, but most people who come to the studio know you as the owner of EQ Studios and you're a multi instruments producer. So most people come here, they're singers, they're yeah. songwriters, and you help them to create those kind of tracks and bring them to life. Is that fair? Absolutely. I, I am a kind of facilitator for, for the clients. So some clients come to me who are really brilliant singers, such as yourself, who are, who are able players, but perhaps not virtuosic players. Um, and so basically I fill in the bits that are missing. I am what they are not, if that makes mm. sense. So I, except obviously for singing, I, I can't sing. But, um, actually, you can't, that's not true, because I've heard you sing, and you can sing, actually. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> but but isn't, well, on that note, actually, because you, you told me before a little bit about your background as a singer, mm. and am I right that, because one of your first gigs, I think you were part of the, was it the production team somewhere at Abbey Road, but were you signed to a label as an artist and as a singer? My group was signed um, right. to, to EMI yeah. oh, back in the mid-70s. That's how old I am. And um, we had a publishing deal with Chapels, um, and I wrote the songs we did. But another guy called Chris Rainbow, he was the main singer. Mm, yeah. So I filled in on backing vocals right, yeah. and stuff like that. So I was finding my role quite early on, which was a, a, almost like a f creative facilitator. Mm. And that's what stayed with me right up to. So date. you you kind of had that role in terms of what that in that in that group. What was your? I was the main writer. Right. Um, and partial arranger. They were pretty good musicians in yeah. the band, you know. But that was my initial role, the composer. And that must have been amazing being signed to EMI and so on. And of course, this is one of the things that's interesting about this because I thought it would be really good to put the camera on and talk to you a little bit about music because mm -hmm. you've seen it in all of its ups and downs. Yeah. You've You've been signed, you've almost been there in your own right as an artist. Mm -hmm. You've worked on a number of tracks and you've had, am I right, I was trying to think about this, a couple of top, top 20 hits and was one of them a top 10? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so, so, you, so you've, you've, you know what it's like and what people are coming through the store and they, presumably they all want to be successful singers, they want to have that, that hit record. Well, there's different agendas for people yeah. coming through the door, um, particularly for older people it's like a vanity exercise okay. or it's like around the golf. They just they prefer to work in a studio than, than have a round of golf. I'm totally yeah. sympathetic to that. Other people though, and the people I relate to mostly are the people who want to be successful really, yeah. in the music industry mm. because then I feel I can take my gloves off and really get mm. stuck in and help them achieve what they want to achieve. And what is it that most of the time it is they need? Because what's interesting about this, we were having a chat outside about all sorts of stuff, what mm. it takes, the, 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 the mindset and so on. Because I guess what's unique about you is that not only on the one hand do musically people get what it is that they need, somebody who can, perhaps that, like me, they're, they're, an, they're an able songwriter and that they can sing, that they really need somebody who can, who can really arrange and, and play the track that they might have and they might, like me, be able to play a few chords on. But you, because you've been around, you understand this, and you're the kind of hum, empathetic human being, you can, you can also personally draw out something that I guess lots of people are, are, can't... Be, their heart and them and them being serious about this kind of stuff. What do you find that people actually need when they come through this through the through the door? Uh, they need to leave their fear behind. Right. It's a huge one. Anxiety, particularly for people who are new to a studio. Right. Anxiety plays a huge part, and so a lot of my job is to make them feel very very welcome. Yeah. Make them feel that I'm here only to serve them and mm. to serve their music. That's my job. Mm. And once they relax and realise that. I'm their friend, mm. quote unquote, then that's when the good stuff starts to happen. Right. Because talented people, they just need the environment for that talent yeah. to, 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 to grow. And I guess there's so much stuff that can get in the way of, of that. You know, I mean, I was saying to you a little bit before that um, I think for me, when I was pursuing singing for a living, you know, trying to pursue singing for a living, I was very much, I'd be in the studio and I'd written the song and then I'm thinking about the, the packaging everything up, sure. sending things up to record labels and not being kind of um, um, kind of presence. So there's just so much stuff in all this kind of stuff that someone's got to get right. So I would imagine that when somebody can actually help them relax and actually enjoy the process and be present in the process mm. and to produce their best performance, that's, that, that's, that's key, right? Yes, it is very much so. And 
not only that's the initial thing if you want is to make people relax and feel easy but then once that then we move to stage two and stage two is where the magic starts to happen and I'm I constantly surprise myself at what I can add to the thing you're a classic case in point there are songs of yours that we've done yeah, we're here playing, we're playing some we're and, and I go gosh did I come up with that mm -hmm. And uh, but the thing is, I didn't really come up with it. I came up with it in an environment, yeah. that, a creative environment that was made by the me yeah. and the client. So this is really interesting what you're saying because you made me realise two things. That so there's one is that environment when one is actually creating yeah. that has got to be conducive. Let's talk a little bit about this other side of stuff where somebody is then pursuing the music industry. The great thing is again, you know what it's a bit like, and and so on. You've been there, you've been signed, you've had a couple of hit records, and so on. What is it? And in this room and in other studios here there are hit records that are being made and I know you've produced um, also done remixes for, for well known sure, people sure, sure. what is it and this is the question I always feel silly for asking not I feel silly asking particular questions what is it that actually makes a hit record because that's the thing that's kind of elusive there are, there are those there are the handful of people I'd imagine you know they are accomplished singer songwriters and they and I guess the, you know going back to the Holland Dozy Holland all those those guys just wrote hit record these guys record. were production line writers of enormous talent mm. Holland Dozy Holland come to mind obviously yeah. they were just really gifted but I'm sure when they were writing they just they were just writing yeah. they didn't really think about it Sam Goldwyn the, the old film producer he put it very neatly when someone said what are you looking for from a new film? He said, more of the same, only different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought that was pretty good. All I can say is I had a little minor hit in, in the late 90s with Tell Me Ma by Shamrock. Mm. Um, and that thing was recorded and mixed 18 months before it was released. And occasionally I would pull it off the shelves and play it to clients because I couldn't hear it. Mm. And what were they saying when they hit? hit. Every, they were all saying a hit. Everyone that heard it said, it's a hit. And but getting, you couldn't hear it. No, I when I dreamt it. Did mm. the song come in a dream? Then? No, no, no it's, yeah. a, it's a traditional song. It's a traditional yeah. Irish song. But when I dreamt the treatment, which was to give it a four on the floor dancey beat, um, I immediately went, "That sounds. That feels like a hit to me." Mm. And in that mental state, I then proceeded to write the the the, the violin obbligato section, the harmonies, and then I called in Phil Larson, who was more of a dance producer, and between us, we worked it. And right along these lines, it was a hit in my head. Mm. And then gradually, as we kept working and working at it, it just became a piece of work mm. that we had to get completed. Mm. But it, it had already taken on its own life, yeah. unbeknownst to me. And, and, so, <laughs> and, so, well, and so with that, when you therefore hear, when you're working with something with somebody else, mm. when you work with an art, another artist, can you sense when there's something quite magical about it that either is a... I guess a commercial hit, or it's a very, very special piece of work that is going to. I would something. go for the latter thing. I haven't a clue what would make a hit. I can hear things like we were doing your piece earlier. What was it? Soul. 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 Soulmates. Soulmates. When I when I heard that, and I hadn't heard it for a little while, and I went, "Wow, that's really lovely." Now, if someone says, "Do you think that's a hit record?" I go, "Well, I'd like it to be because mm. I think it's a great piece of music," but. I don't know, mm. and and it's partly because I'm involved in it. Mm. You know, mm. as soon as I become involved in it, I'm not as aware of it. I'm not as able to be objective about it. So it's really interesting what you were saying before about the particular piece that uh, you know the Tell Me Ma track, and mm -hmm. then when that thing about could you uh, asking other people to listen to it. So I guess was there something about it where you thought <coughs> that, that 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 evokes that? Because I'd imagine that won't happen all the time. Well, I knew we were going to try and release it at some point and I really just needed to do a bit of market research and the only people I could market research were clients mm. and 100% of market research said it's a hit record but I couldn't hear at all and then uh, Jonathan King sorry <coughs> took, a, took it over to the States played it to the Clive Calder who owned um, Zomba and he just said well that's my next um, Cotton Eye Joe which I hadn't yeah. thought of but he'd caught Nigel Joe at the time, which had sold millions. Mm. He said, that's my next caught Nigel. Joe. Give them limeys a whole lot of money, which they did, thank you. And uh, that's how it all evolved. I'm going to pause the camera now, and then I'm going to come back very briefly just to talk a little bit more, because we were chatting outside about the ups and downs and music. Because most of the times, it will be what lots of people call downs, but what's great about working with you is that you just have such a joy for music and working with people that... Mm. I guess that's even interesting in itself, isn't it? That that sometimes we're only 
our focus is just about that here. So I want, I'm going to pause the camera and for us to come back and just talk a little bit more about that before we, before we close. Cool.